Guy McPherson wrote a book called Going Dark, and his point of view is that we are on the verge of abrupt climate change with all the most negative consequences from it. When he says abrupt, he means abrupt. He is, he is I guess if you could, um, Guy, maybe give us a guideline on your time frame of, what, of when you think abrupt climate change is likely, and I was wondering if the rest of you could respond of um, what your thoughts are. I guess we all hope that um, Guy's thoughts or predictions are not accurate. We're hoping that they're not because they're disturbing and scary, but uh, I'd like to hear Guy's thoughts and what your thoughts about what he's saying. It's pretty clear that we're in the midst of abrupt climate change. Um, the temperature of the planet increased about one degree Celsius from 1750 to September of 2015, and then increased another five or six tenths degree Celsius in the next four months. Those are the good old days, back in February and March. Since then, every month, we've set a, a new temperature record for global average temperature. And we just found out that yesterday, that in August, we did the same thing. So I would say we're in the midst of abrupt climate change now, and a phenomenon that has precedence in Earth history, with, for example, a global average temperature rise of five degrees Celsius in 13 years based on sediment records, as reported in a paper in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in 2013. And beyond that, I just soon not get into where this leads. You can read, or you can view my presentation from earlier today um, on what the, what the science indicates with respect to the loss of global dimming and the, the temperature rise locked in as a result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere based on the 10-year lag in emissions and maximum heating and so forth. I don't have a lot to contribute here, Steve. These guys know the data, you know, a lot, a lot better than I do. All, all I'll share with you is that personally my perspective on it has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, 10 years ago I heard all these climate guys talking about, you know, how much um, the climate was going to change, what its implications were for rainfall and snowfall and, and evaporation in that. And I, you know, and I thought, all right, they're talking about 40 year, 50 year, 100 year time frames. Um, in the meantime, there's a whole lot of other problems I got to deal with with the way that people are using water. Um, I will say that in the last 10 years, my perspective on that has changed quite a lot. And some of the records that we are seeing for things like uh, the timing of when snow packs in the Rocky Mountains start to melt off, um, which has huge implications for how much water becomes available downstream. When, when that water comes rushing off of the Rocky Mountains, um, it has a lot, and, and if a lot of that water is washing off in the, in the, earlier in the spring, there's not going to be as much water that's going to slowly still be coming off when you get into the dog days of summer during July and August and September. And so, our rivers are starting to drop to levels that we haven't seen before because all the same amount of water perhaps coming off in general, but it's coming off much earlier. Um, and our systems of using water aren't adapted to that. And um, so my appreciation for it has certainly changed. I, I, we have a, um, it's, it's, a, it's a much more serious problem um, for all of us to grapple with than I even thought about 10 years ago. So I, I'm not going to disagree with Guy or Brian. What I'm going to do is try and broaden it out. Um, yes, we should be very concerned about climate change. Yes, I'm uh, uh, excited that Paris actually brought 193 countries together, and actually we have an agreement that countries are going to try to reduce their carbon footprint. Again, the cynics among you might actually say, right, let's see whether it actually happens or not. But there is now uh, an understanding at the international level and within uh, politics of most countries that climate change is affecting uh, the people. It is affecting what's happening. And what's exciting, I think, sometimes in the United States is sometimes uh, other countries hear the rhetoric 
uh, sort of like with the Republicans going, we don't believe in climate change, we don't believe in climate change. But what they don't see, and I'm very lucky because I've worked so much with my colleagues in the US, is at the state level, many states, many governors realize this is an issue and are actually working uh, very hard about this. Again, in the northeast uh, of the country, there's a trading scheme to trade um, carbon dioxide. Uh, California has very strict rules and wants to actually cut their emissions by 80% by 2050. So you have lots of these incredible uh, things going on at the state level that don't actually get heard at the international level. And unfortunately, uh, all we hear is the negative views coming out. So I think there's, there is room for optimism uh, in the United States that climate change is being taken seriously. But I also want to broaden this out that actually humans on the planet, it isn't just about climate change. The environmental degradation that we see is exacerbating the water conditions that sort of uh, Brian's looking at. Uh, we have uh, deforestation, which is causing dust bowls in many parts of the world. We also then have an overuse of fertilizers, nitrates, and things like that. And again, lots of pollutants. So I think that we need to actually take a long, hard look and say, OK, we all want to be middle class. We all want to have our sort of, uh, um, sort of lifestyle. How do we actually do that, but at the same time, be stewards of the planet and actually look after the environment, which at the end of the day provides us with clean air, unless you happen to be in certain cities in China or in Los Angeles, uh, clean drinking water, okay, and the food that we survive on. Okay? So if, again, we forget this. We, we're in this bubble of, I would say, um, TV and gadgets. We, we don't actually realize that the three most important things, clean air, clean water, and food, all reliant on our environment, which we're actually starting to affect in a very severe way. Mm. Well, <coughs> with, with the rise of the predicted extreme rise in temperature, it's, it's true that most species that ever existed are now extinct. Maybe our time has come. <laughs> we hope not, but uh, you know, in terms of you are suggesting to take a long, hard look. Uh, I, I think the, the long, hard look should include also an understanding of what, what the climate is all about and, and what are the underlying features. I was shocked to find out, I was a, on an interview program uh, together with a, with a uh, climatologist, uh, and he told me during this interview that, that the, uh, the uh, scientists who are considering weather uh, don't there are two things they don't understand and one is clouds and the other is evaporation and I was shocked because you'd think that somebody who is interested in this subject and doing this professionally would know very well but in fact it's not known uh, the physicists don't understand and uh, for an example is uh, I gave you a few examples a, a moment ago but even evaporation so all of us are taught that you know, if you have, if you have a, a glass of water and evaporation is occurring, uh, some molecules near the surface get a kick of potential energy or kinetic energy and they rise up and that's what evaporation is all about. And it's easy, we learn that, we think that. Um, but the observations seem to, to go against that and you can, you can see that just by going to your local Starbucks and having a, a, a cup of, uh, of hot coffee, right? You see the vapor rising from the coffee itself. If you've got a dark background like black, you can see the vapor rising. Well, it's known that if you can see the vapor, the vapor must consist of little droplets and they have to be bigger than the wavelength of light. So the wavelength of light is about half a micron and people have, have, have measured what's rising up, and it's actually 10 or 20 or 30 micron, tiny little droplets that are actually rising. So these droplets may contain something like 10 to the 10th molecules of water. That's what evaporates. We're taught that evaporation is one molecule of water at a time, but the observations um, directly con contravene the, this, this understanding. So, if we, if we don't really understand the nature of evaporation and we don't understand how the clouds form, um, the, trying to ameliorate the situation in, in some way, the situation which is getting progressively worse, obviously, 
is going to be difficult to do. And so m my suggestion is if we want to address this, one of the things we need to address is an understanding of what gives rise to the weather cycle that occurs. And we don't have that understanding. That sounds like one of my grant applications. We need to do more research on this.